Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Traversing the Stars podcast. How are my loyal listeners? Thank you for your continued support. As always, hit that subscribe button, everybody. An amazing show for you all because Boy the Mothership is Spencer Garrett. You know him from so many projects, including the show Supernatural. He now plays Chick Hearn in Winning Time, The Rise of the Lakers Dynasty on HBO Max. Now come join me as we go Traversing the Stars. Hello, Mr. Garrett. Thank you so much for coming to the First of the Stars podcast. My pleasure, Jeff. Good to be with you, brother. Totally my pleasure. I'm a big fan of yours from Supernatural, from Winning Time. You are fantastic. Thank you so much. Totally my pleasure. Um, so I always start off with a question of inspiration. So what inspired you to become an actor and who are your earliest influences? Uh, well, what inspired me, I guess, is uh, my own family. I'm a third generation actor. My grandparents uh, were both actors. Uh, they ran a theater on... Uh, something that is doesn't really exist anymore, but it was a showboat uh, called the Goldenrod Showboat, and it was docked on uh, the Mississippi River in St. Louis, and there was a theater on it, and my grandma and grandpa raised my mom and my aunt, both of whom became actors, on the showboat, and they, they did theater on the boat. And uh, my uncle was an actor. I've got several cousins who are actors, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of swimming in it. It was unavoidable. <laughs> so that's so, in your blood. It's in my blood. And yeah, that's, uh, I would say probably those are the influences, you know, just in terms of my family and it's in my blood and in my bones. But uh, my my influences as a kid, when I decided to start doing this in earnest and really jump into it as a career, probably I would have to say Spencer Tracy, who is my namesake, uh, no surprise there, but uh, Jack Lemon, uh, Jack Nicholson, Gene Hackman, Robert Duvall, uh, Colleen Dewhurst, um, oh gosh, uh, Meryl Streep in the early days. I mean, I, I so many, so many people growing up as a young actor when I was in my twenties, people that inspired me to to do what I do, and and uh, I I continue to to learn from them, and when I watch their films, and and uh, and to learn and grow from all the actors that I that I get to work with and watch over the years. So being that you're um basically two generations worth of actors in, in your family or performers three. in your family, three, three. generations, Jesus yeah. Christ, three generations in, in your family. Um, so what did you learn by just experiencing that world that they were living in? I mean, did you get a sense of how a day to day of an actor goes, that kind of thing? Oh, sure. I mean, I knew what a roller coaster ride it was uh, emotionally and financially. I mean, my mom was a bit of a television star in the late you know, 60s and 70s and she was the first woman. She became the first woman president of a labor union. She was the president of the Screen Actors Guild. Oh, very um, cool. But her fortunes sort of rose and fall, you know, it would r rise and fall over the years. Uh, being a woman in the industry at, at that time in the 50s, 60s and 70s. And so, you know, we, from one minute to the next, you know, you never you never knew whether she'd be working steadily or not. My parents split up when I was quite young and so um, I, I knew I got a taste firsthand early on of what the business can do to a person. Um, you know, you're on this sort of roller coaster ride and sometimes you're, you know, you're on that upward trajectory and sometimes you're going down. And uh, but if you love it as much as as my grandparents did and my mom did, um, you know, you stick with it and you stick it out and, and you just ride the ride the crests and the waves as they come. So that's something that I learned early on when I jumped into the business at 23, 24, when I made the decision to become an actor, I knew that it was, you know, it was a roller coaster ride and you take the, you take the hits and you take the, the highs and the lows as they come. So when you told your, um, your mother and your, your father, when you, that you were going to jump on this roller coaster, did they yeah. embrace the idea or were they like, Oh, wait a second, back off. <laughs> I think, uh, I think they both knew it was sort of inevitable. My father was a talent agent and a talent manager. He represented actors. So he, he, he knew the business inside and out. And, and I think he, my father probably would have preferred that I do something a little bit more stable, uh, being a talent, a, a talent agent himself for 50 years. Uh, he knew what an unstable life show business could be mm -hmm. and what unstable people actors could be from time to time. So I think when I told him, I said, dad, I'm, I think I'm going to do this. I, you know, this, there's nothing that I love more than being on stage and, 
and doing theater and 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 doing creative things. And so uh, he called my mom, apparently called my mom and said, you're never going to believe it, Kathy. Our son wants to be an actor. And she said, what did you expect? An astronaut? I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean he's, he's the he's the, a grandchild of actors and he grew up. I mean, I literally grew up in green rooms and backstages and in my mom's trailer on whatever film or television set she was working on as a child. Mm. I mean, I would she'd bring me to the set and I'd be I'd be I spent my childhood on film and television sets. So when I made the decision to jump into this, it was no surprise to me, uh, but I think maybe a little bit to my a little bit to my dad and my my mom knew it was inevitable. And so she just said, if you're going to do this, then make sure you study with the right people. So mm. uh, which is what I what I started to do. I started studying. Uh, I studied with a, a man named Sanford Meisner, who was sort of a legendary acting teacher and who my mom also studied with at the neighborhood playhouse in the 1950s. So I studied for a good six, seven years before I really started to embark on this. So when you were um, learning to act under Sanford uh, Meisner, um, what was that experience experience like? What attributes did he offer you as, you know, as an actor that may have not been available to a lesser teacher or from a lesser teacher? Uh, what was that experience like? I mean, I, I had a very, very fortunate experience in working with him. He took 20 students every summer to his home. He had a home on the island of Bequi in the West Indies, a tiny little island uh, off the coast of uh, near St. Vincent in the, uh, in, the, in the West Indies. And I spent six weeks with him studying there, just immersed in Meisner technique. And then I came back and I studied with him here in Los Angeles for a couple of years. He was very, very tough on me, um, which I didn't realize until much later the reason he was so tough on me. I, I, took it, I, I took it hard when I was with him in my early 20s, and I thought he was really beating up on me. And I didn't realize till many years later that he was so hard on me because he recognized that I was pretty good. Um, and he saw the potential in me. And so he wanted to sort of nurture that and bring it out. So uh, it was a it was a, a kind of a trial by fire working with Mr. Meisner, and he really tried to get the best out of me. So, um, and I'm 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 indebted to him to this day. I mean, I he was a, an extraordinary mentor, an extraordinary teacher to me, and a lot of what I bring to to my work, uh, whether it's a film or a play or whatever, is rooted in in rooted in that teaching, rooted in what he what he passed down to me through all those classes over the years. Now, now, when you said he selected 20 students, now you had already, you were already attending a, an acting theater college? Well, that was like my, that? my first experience with him as a teacher was on this island, on the island of Beckwe. We lived there, we, and we just, we would wake up in the morning and go to classes. He had a theater built in his house, and there were 10 girls and 10 boys, and we did these workshops and uh, exercises, and uh, we just lived and breathed the Meisner technique every day, uh, seven days a week for six weeks. And then when I was done with that, uh, I went back to New York. I started working a little bit. And then Mr. Meisner, who ran the Neighborhood Playhouse Theater, a legendary theater a, a acting school in New York City, where, gosh, Gregory Peck and Diane Keaton and Joanne Woodward and Robert Duvall and Steve McQueen and my mother and on and on and on. A lot of great acting uh, students came out of uh, Mr. Meisner's class at the Neighborhood Playhouse that went on to great, great careers. So Mr. Meisner moved to Los Angeles and I studied with him here in LA at the Neighborhood Playhouse West here in LA. Uh, and I was with him off and on for about five, six years. That's incredible. And I, I like this idea that he was so hard on you because he knew you had talent. Now, yeah. now, how long did it take you to figure out that that's what was happening? Because you said you figured out eventually that he wasn't just picking on you. It was it just years looking back or at that moment did you have a epiphany? Uh, it, like it, there was a there was a sort of a pivotal moment where after being with him for a few years uh, and, you know, tr doing what I thought was quality work for him and with him in his classes. Uh, and one day uh, I'll never forget it. I mean, if I ever write a book someday, this will be in the book. <laughs> he had a, a, a bamboo cane with a pearl handle on it that my mother had given him. My mother had studied with him for many, many years off and on throughout the course of her career over like 50, 60 years. She kept going back to Sandy's classes and she gave him this cane that he, that he used. Um, and I was doing an exercise in his class and my mom was coming to pick me up after class to take us all out to dinner, me and her and Mr. Meisner. We were all going out to dinner after class that night. This is after knowing and working with Mr. Meisner for now 
four, five, six years, I think at this point. And I had a pretty good rapport with him, but he was just, he was tough on me all the time. And this one particular night I was doing an exercise and I, something that I said or did rang falsely to him. He had very bad, if you've ever seen pictures of him, he had very bad eyesight. He had his voice box removed, so he spoke through a microphone attached to his glasses that came out of a speaker. Um, it was fascinating, but he sounded like this, and it came out of a speaker, and he could barely see, but he could hear if you were acting falsely, if there was if there, if there was no truth to what you were bringing on stage. He could mm. sense it. Even if he couldn't see it, he could sense it. And whatever I did, and all of a sudden, I looked over, and he took his cane, and he slammed it down on the ground, on the floor, of the theater that we were working in and the cane shattered all over the floor and he started yelling at me and he said god damn it spencer how many times do i have to tell you and i was just standing there like in tears and just just heartbroken and i thought oh my god in front of my mom and it was just terrible anyway the class was over he gave me he he, he just ripped me a new one in front of the entire class um because i think everybody thought i was sort of his golden boy and he just really tore me a new one. And when class was over, uh, he came up to me and he said, OK, let's go to dinner. And I said, I don't want to go to dinner with you. And my mom said, we're going to dinner. We're going to dinner. Anyway, we, we went out to dinner and I was just miserable. And I finally said, Sandy, why were you why did you bust that cane? And like, why did you make such a scene? And he said, because you're good, <laughs> because you're good. And 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 I and I knew that you were you were trying to impress your mom in that moment and you were acting and I caught you acting. And that's the worst <laughs> sin of an actor is to be caught acting. Mm. And so unfortunately, he he broke this beautiful cane that my mom had given him. But my mom understood what was going on. And uh, anyway, I, it, it he explained it to me in that moment at dinner. And and I thought, OK, well, I, I guess that's. <laughs> that that's your way of tough love um, but it was a great it was a great lesson and it's true I saw my mom in the back of the class I knew she was there and I was sort of like trying to impress her a little bit I was 23 or 24 and I was trying to put a little extra mustard on whatever I was doing and he didn't like that and man did he let me know and so when I said why are you being such a hard ass on me he said because you're good and you should be better than that and he was right he was right so. I mean, not just a book. I make a movie. I mean, I just picture this guy with the bamboo uh, cane, oh, big yeah. glasses, a microphone. Out that, 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 that's a visual. <laughs> I, I would love to play him sometime in a film. I would. I mean, what a great, literally, because the glasses were like three inches thick. Uh, he had cataract operations and he had a busted hip and he had the cane and he had this little microphone that dangled. that was like clipped onto the side of his glasses and his voice came out of a speaker in the classroom. And it sounded like this. When I first started to study with him, he used to smoke. He had, a, you know, he had a hole in his larynx, and he used to smoke through the hole in his neck. <laughs> Jesus. And finally, like the students said, we, you can't. He would smoke in class, in the middle of class. He'd be like, he'd be smoking Carlton cigarettes. He'd light a cigarette and he'd smoke it through his <laughs> neck. And we're like, no, 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 that's not going to work. So, yeah. as great as you are, you know, it's it was like making it was turning too many people off. So. <laughs> He stopped smoking in class, but he'd take a break and he'd go smoke a cigarette through his neck hole out in the alleyway. Well, you're definitely making a movie here. This is a movie about definitely this guy now that you got to make. Yeah. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I got to look up. I got to look up this guy now to see an actual picture. Look him up, of him. Sanford Meisner. There's a great. There's actually a wonderful film about him that you can find on YouTube. It's called San, Sanford Meisner: The Theater's Best Kept Secret, and his book. Uh, Sanford Meisner on acting is like is the Bible for me. It's one of the best acting books ever. Mm. Yeah, that, that that is really cool. And like I said, obviously it worked because you've had a phenomenal career. You have an IDMB Pro page that's extremely lengthy in size. Um, most recently, uh, you play you're in uh, Winning Time: The Rise of the Lakers Dynasty, which is a wonderful, wonderful series. I mean. Thank you. I, I got so engrossed in it. I actually got my wife who hates basketball engrossed in it as well. Ah, it's there just, you go. It's just That's so great. well done. Yeah. So how did you get involved with uh, Winning Time? I auditioned. I auditioned for the casting director. I heard there was a part of Chick Hearn. Uh, I grew up as a Laker fan here in LA as a kid going to those Laker games in the late 70s. And Chick Hearn uh, was a part of LA culture. If you watch Laker games 
on Channel 9 out here or listen to him on the radio, his voice and his vibe and his mannerisms, everything about him, he was part of the Lakers. I mean, he was kind of like the, the, uh, the heart and soul of that team. And so if you were a Laker fan in L.A., you knew who Chick Hearn was. So when I had the opportunity to audition to play him, um, it was big shoes to fill, I knew, but I also knew it was a role that I could get if I went and auditioned well. Um, I did not know Adam McKay, but I'd met him a couple of years earlier and, and uh, at, at the premiere for the movie Vice, which he directed. And I went up to him afterwards and I just introduced myself and I said, I'm, I'd love to work with you someday. Uh, and, uh, and he said, well, you weren't on my radar before, but you are now. And three years later, uh, I, I read for the Chick Hearn role probably, I don't know how many other guys auditioned for that part, but I went in, I went in for my audition. And I had a pretty good feeling when I walked out that room that, uh, that uh, I just, I just, I just knew it went well. And a couple of weeks later, I got the news that I'd gotten the part. And then we, sh we shot the pilot not long after that. Uh, and then we got picked up to series, but then we were supposed to start filming in April of 2020, but then that was when COVID hit and we mm -hmm. shut down for an entire year. So we started, we, we shut down for a year and we started filming in April of 2021. So I had a lot of time to, uh, to, to do my research and, and work on, on, on getting him just right. So uh, that's, that's it. But I, I auditioned like, like a lot of other actors and I just got lucky. So, so when you auditioned, you knew it was for Chick Hearn. They told you ahead of time. Oh, sure. this oh you yeah. yeah. No, it was, I mean, there the sides, the, the pages that they gave me in the script were it was 10 pages of Chick Hearn calling a basketball game. Uh, you know, magic to Kareem, Kareem to Cooper, blah, blah, blah. You know, it was like, it was calling a game. And then there was a scene with Pat Riley, who is eventually was, you know, to be played by Adrian Brody, who's so wonderful in that role. So uh, it was a scene between Chick and, and Pat Riley. And, uh, and then it was a scene, and there was another scene of Chick calling a game. So I had to memorize all of that. And then I went in the room, I dressed in a 1970s period polyester suit and did my hair as best I could. I don't look anything like him. Uh, if you look up pictures of Chick Hearn, so they when we shot the when we shot the pilot, the this the makeup artist, wonderful woman named Jamie Hess, who uh, I, who is just an extraordinary makeup artist. She designed prosthetics to make me to make my facial features look more like Chick Hearn. Mm. So, so so when so when you were I mean once you got the, the part of Chick Hearn and you did a fantastic job with it. When you were determining how you're going to do it, were you thinking I'm going to play it as you know um, as Chick Hearn, or you're going to play a your version of Chick Hearn? You know, I, the, the I, I'm I'm doing as much of an impersonation of him as I can, because his voice, obviously, his voice is so specific. So I, I really wanted to get his voice as as perfectly as I could. Uh, he had very distinctive mannerisms, a very distinctive speaking style, a very distinctive style of communicating, um, not just as an announcer on the sidelines, but when he would interview players, when he would, whether it was Magic Johnson or Michael Jordan or Kareem or Shaq or whoever, he had a very, uh, a really warm, welcoming style that made you feel like he was a player as well. His breadth of knowledge mm -hmm. of the game of basketball was, was unparalleled. And so uh, a lot of that factored into my portrayal of him as well. So I mean, I don't know how closely I'm getting it, but a lot of people are telling me that it's pretty damn close. Mm -hmm. uh, even though I don't really look much like Chick Hearn, uh, I'm, I'm getting his essence and getting his vibe. And uh, I, got, I got that uh, from his granddaughter, uh, who I met before we shot the pilot. I got a chance to meet Chick's granddaughter, who paid me a lovely compliment and said, you're, 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 getting, you're getting grandpa uh just right so oh, that's, that's awesome yeah that so that means that means more to me than anything else now um so i'm not a, I'm a great mem perfect memory of your um id idmb pro page i am imdb i yeah. imdb uh, for a, a you know what i'm talking about <laughs> um is this the first time you've played a living person and is there more pressure in trying to play someone who was alive oh no I, this is probably my 12th or 13th living person uh, I mean, I played everybody from Bob Woodward to Joe McCarthy. Uh, I played uh, uh, Tom DeLay uh, in, a, in a film called Casino Jack. Um, I played a lot of real life characters. Uh, this is the first time. I mean, uh, I think there was some, this might be the first time. Bob Woodward, I played a couple of years ago in a film called Front Runner uh, with Hugh Jackman for Jason Reitman. Uh, and Bob Woodward is obviously still very much with us. Chick Hearn passed away in 2002. Um, 
but uh, no, I played a lot of a lot of real life characters. So obviously, there's a there's a, a responsibility to to get that right, you know, mm. to honor to honor that to honor that person and and to uh, uh, and I, again with somebody like uh, uh, like Sean Hannity, for example, in Bombshell, who is a real life person who's very much alive. Uh, to me, he's one of the most horrible human beings on the planet, uh, and he's a bit of a cartoon character anyway. So I didn't really feel terribly responsible. Uh, he, I, the, I, I did an impression of him that ended up looking like a cartoon. Uh, <laughs> like, so I thought, okay, I've done my job there. That's perfect. I saw the picture of Sean Handy in, in, um, in the corner. I was like, uh oh. But oh, yeah, no, that's. that's... <laughs> yeah, I'm always looking over my shoulder. Yep, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I agree 100% he's an awful human being. So no, that was fantastic. Um, so also because you said you were a fan of LA basketball at the time as well, um, and obviously then of Chip Hearn, was there also feeling a pressure that, you know, not only are you playing the part, but now you have all this feeling of, you know, remembering what he's like watching the games and now trying to get yourself in that same kind of feeling of the fan watching that game and trying, you know what I'm saying? That added pressure. Did that make it more difficult to do the performance? Uh, no, I, I, not not really. I, I mean, I think because uh, I've done my homework and I've done my research, and so by the time I walk onto that set, I I have a pretty good sense of what it is I'm going to do. And then when we're getting into the the basketball game, uh, when I'm calling the games, uh, I don't know if you've seen the entire yeah series. So you know, episode nine, episode ten, the championship games with the 76ers, Sixers. Um, I'm obviously talking a lot. Uh, so a lot of that dialogue was done on a soundstage doing ADR, doing mm. a looping. Uh, that dialogue was written for me. So I did that in a, se in a separate chunk of uh, work time. But a lot of it was, you know, in the moment, on the set, on the soundstage. And uh, so I, I had free reign to kind of improv and throw in my own, throw in my own stuff. Because Chick was, obviously, he, he had these things called Chickisms. Uh, he coined the term slam, he uh, slam dunk swish. Uh, his famous catchphrase was, uh, this game is in the refrigerator. The lights are out, the door is closed. The butter's getting hard. The eggs are cooling and the jello's jiggling. I mean, that's one of 200, uh, chickisms that he said over the course mm. of a 40 year career, he called something like 3,338 games in a row. So his work ethic was extraordinary, but he had just such a fluid style that uh, I wanted to try to capture that. And uh, so I got, I was given kind of license to kind of like vamp and play and, and be as loose with it as I could while the dolly track was going, you know, the, the camera was going back up and forth on the dolly uh, up and down the court. Um, I just had fun and, and played with it as much as I could all the while knowing that I had a responsibility to, you know, stay in that same headspace mm. and get the voice right and all of that. And, you know, and the cool thing about winning time uh, watching it is that it's filmed as if it was filmed in like the 80s, in yeah. the 80s. I mean, it has, yeah. it almost, it almost looked like a documentary in, in, uh, yeah. uh, in, in how it was filmed. But, you know, what was, you know, why do you think it, it was, it works so perfectly and why that time period of the 80s Lakers, Magic Johnson, uh, Kareem Abdul Jabbar, it's just that magical period where people just always remember the, that, you know, basketball period. I think it's, it's like uh, for those who are old enough to remember that, that era, that showtime era of basketball, uh, seeing it the way it's shot, uh, it's shot on, they used v, an actual VHS camera. They shot it on super eight film. They shot it on 35 millimeter film. Not a lot of films or television shows are shot on 35 uh, or, or film of any kind for that matter. So the grainy quality of it, the documentary cinema verite style that you see uh, was intentional. It was to kind of take you back and to, to be sort of evocative of that time period. And I think that's that's one of the things it does so, so brilliantly is it takes you back. Obviously, uh, the younger generation, people in their 20s, 30s that are watching the show, that are respond to it, responding to it, uh, were not aware of a lot of that stuff going on back then. Um, so I think a lot of the cinematography trickery is kind of lost on them, but for a certain generation that, that, that grew up watching those games and watching that exciting period of time in basketball and in the NBA, uh, it just brings back, you know, a flood of memories. And I think that's what it does so beautifully. Yeah. And I think some of the best moments in the show um, is some of your interactions with uh, Adrian Brody, who plays Pat Riley, as you, as you said, 
um, not only um, off, um, you know, in the booth as well when you're when he's trying to practice or at least re, re, try to um, audition for a part with you uh, or Trey on, on the thing. That's fantastic. So what was it like to have, of course, Agent Brody? Well, how did you guys make that chemistry work like that? I, I don't know. I think it's just it's just uh, two guys that really like each other and respect each other's work. The first time we met each other in the world was the afternoon that we shot that first scene where he comes and asks me for a job. Uh, I'm in my office. I'm dyeing my hair, and he comes in, and I, I tell him to make a a, 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 a tape, uh, a, you know, a, a, an audition tape. And uh, we met that afternoon. I'd gotten out of makeup. It's about a two and a half, three hour process to put me in those prosthetics. So I was in the makeup trailer. He was sitting next to me. They were putting on his mustache and wig. And we got a chance to kind of shoot the shit in the, in the makeup trailer. And then after that, we went to his trailer and we spent the next four or five hours uh, running the scene and just kind of getting to know each other and feeling out the dynamic of each other. We didn't shoot that scene until about 1130 that night. Uh, I, I think I, re I remember that day I came in to hair and makeup at like 530 in the morning. We didn't shoot that scene until about 11 o'clock that night. So um, we were both pretty tired. And so there was kind of a loose vibe. And uh, we ran it a couple of times and it was just it was lightning in a bottle. It just was a great feeling. We just we were both smiling ear to ear when we did that first scene because we somehow found a way to establish a rapport mm. uh, of two guys that that knew and respected and liked each other and that had, had a working relationship with each other. Obviously, Chick knew Pat from his playing days with the Lakers uh, earlier on in 72. So there was a there was a, a history there. And, uh, you know, we had five hours to try to find that. And, you know, we sat in Adrian's trailer and had a had a cup of coffee and just kind of ran it over and over and found an ease with one another. And that's that's what actors do. We didn't have a lot of time to rehearse or practice it. I literally met him that day. And our relationship grew over time. I mean, the stuff, the, the other scene with the, the fisting, all of that, um, that was uh, several episodes later, I think. I think it was two episodes later in episode five. Um, and at that point, we had a kind of a shorthand with each other. We just really, uh, we knew how to work with each other. He's a fantastic actor. I have great respect for him. It was, it's kind of funny. Um, I felt like the chemistry between you and Agent Brody was, was so good that you kind of wish the real Pat Riley and Chick Hearn had worked that well. So it would have been more... Um, parts of you two working together behind you know on, on at the booth during the game well if that was the case then uh, you wouldn't have pat riley as the coach i mean that part's true. <laughs> you know if, 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 if pat had stayed on as chick's assistant uh who knows what had happened i mean P pat pat was there was that scene he was reluctant to uh uh to 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 join uh westhead as as an assistant coach i mean there was a kind of a he'd had this he'd had this job and if you remember the episode when mckinney is in the hospital yeah uh and Pat is deciding, uh, you know, whether to take the job or not. And uh, if, if that hadn't happened, then history would have gone a whole different way. But, uh, mm. uh, you know, I had, a, I had a great time with Adrian sitting next to Adrian during those days when we were filming. And um, I, it was, it was a kind of a bittersweet moment because there was a scene several episodes later, we're walking onto an airplane, we're traveling to go play a game. And, uh, and he turns the camera and he says, I'm going to miss you, Chick. I'd, I'd, I'd handed him my bag. I'd handed him like, like dry, my dry cleaner or something as I was walking out of the plane, which is something that Chick actually did. Like he, Chick, Chick made Pat his gopher from time <laughs> to time, which Pat hated. Um, and uh, so Riley turns the camera, Adrian turned the camera and he said, I'm going to miss you, Chick. Uh, <laughs> you know, so Pat, uh, Adrian and I won't have much to do with each other, uh, at least on the sidelines, but moving forward in, in season two, uh, I'll be right there next to him, you know, on the court. So season two has already been confirmed. Uh, it's been confirmed and we allegedly start up sometime in the fall. That's all I know. Uh, you're definitely part of season two. I, I imagine yes. this is fantastic. Yeah. Now, now one thing I found that's kind of fascinating about winning time, right there, I think it was 11 episodes told in the first season. Yeah. And there are six different directors that were, who sh that shot over those, those 11 episodes. Uh, one of them I believe was Jonah Hill, um, the, the actor. Mm -hmm. So, so what was it like, or how does it affect the performance when you have different directors? I mean, were the styles, were you at all affected by different styles of directing? Were they similar in how they approach directing? I, well, I wasn't, I mean, I can't speak to anybody else, but I, I wasn't affected because I would come in. Uh, I think one of my episodes, the first scene was uh, directed by uh, a director named Damian Marcano, who was in kind of a newcomer. Uh, and then the scene, the fisting scene, 
was uh, directed by a, uh, a woman named Tanya Hamilton. Every, every director is different. Every director brings something different to the party. Um, but uh, it didn't, it didn't, doesn't really affect me. If they, if they show up and they're well prepared, as well prepared as I am, then, uh, uh, then my, my job is, my job is halfway done. You know, um, the last couple of episodes were directed by, uh, a, a, a woman who's also an actor, Sally Richardson Whitfield, who's, who's directs a lot of television. She directs a lot of the Gilded Age also for HBO. Um, wonderful, wonderful directors. So I love working with different directors on every episode. So it kind of mixes it up a little bit and each one of them brings a different vibe. I mean, I remember when I worked with Jonah in episode two, the first episode after the pilot episode, uh, there was a scene in the boardroom with all of us, with John C. and me and uh, the great Brett Cullen who plays Bill Sharman. And I didn't have a lot to do in that scene initially as scripted. And Jonah was in the other room and he was yelling at me through the, through the, from the behind the, from behind the, they call it video village where he watches on the monitor. And Jonah would say, go over to the bar, grab some ice out of the ice, uh, out of the ice bucket, start making a drink, start making drinks for people at the table, like be the ringmaster. And he was sort of throwing things at me that added to my performance that added to me. Like I was basically I had two lines or something in, in that scene. And I ended up kind of becoming more of a, a focal point or more of a, you know, more of a, a, a player in that scene because Jonah was throwing ideas at me and giving me things to do uh, that weren't that weren't on the written page. And I love directors like that, that that come up with ideas and that collaborate with you and and encourage you to find more things to do. Now, without stepping into it too deeply, um, do act directors who have been actors do they make better directors or the different or they make better types 100%, of hundred percent hundred percent thousand percent I love working I love working with with uh, with directors who uh, who were or are actors one of my favorite directors of all time is Jonathan Frakes uh, from Star Trek yes uh, was one of my very first jobs ever as an, as a young actor on on Star Trek Next Generation he was an actor obviously on the show and he had just started directing around that time. And uh, and I've worked with him several times over the years, and I just I just I, I love working here with him. He'll call me up out of the blue and say, hey, "I'm directing an episode of whatever. Do you want to come to Vancouver and hang out with me for a couple of weeks?" Uh, anytime, anytime Jonathan calls and I'm free, because uh, he just loves actors. He loves mm. everything about the process, and he knows how to talk to actors. And a lot of directors don't. A lot of directors like it's like moving furniture around on a set. They they talk to actors like. Uh, like they're kind of pieces of a puzzle. Uh, there's something about an actor, uh, an actor director, who just has a has a, a shorthand and a rapport with a with a, with a, with another actor that that most directors just don't have. But that's great. I mean, um, as a, fans, uh, we're all fans. I think Jonathan Franks, that guy Franks, he did some fantastic directing, and yeah. obviously he was great as um, Riker. We, we all are a fan of that. So that's that's really cool uh, that you have a great rapport with him. That's awesome. Oh, he's terrific. He's <laughs> and he's become very very dear friend. Him and I mean that was one of the first things I did. And so Jonathan and uh, Sir Patrick and Lavar, who's who's become a dear friend. All of those that whole gang from that whole cast, uh, because it was one of my first sort of meteor guest star roles. Um, I, I've, I've worked with all of them at various points over the years in the last 25, 30 years, but Jonathan and LeVar in particular have become very close friends. So with all that um, now, uh, connection with Star Trek, do you think you'll ever um, join when the Star Trek franchises, they seem to be popping up regularly? <laughs> I, I would be happy to. Somebody, somebody posted something on Twitter the other day, and it was like, uh, next generation actors most likely to appear in Picard. Uh, and I, it was sort of a very clickbaity thing, and I clicked on it, and I, and and there I was, uh, and I was one of maybe fifteen people. It was somebody's wish list that they had put on yeah. Twitter about actors from TNG that they were hoping would be on Picard. So I sent that Twitter thing to Frakes, and I said, <laughs> "Let's get on it, man." And he said, "And he said I love the idea of Riker and and uh, uh, and Simon Tarsus together again in an episode of Picard." And Picard and I said, of course, I had to say, make it so. Yes. So, so I mean, should we read into that that we're, no. we should expect you now in Picard nope. season three? Nope, 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 nope. 
<laughs> don't read into anything. You don't read into anything in this business. Nothing, nothing is nothing is true until, at least for an actor, nothing is true until you're sitting in your trailer and you're signing your contract. So <laughs> it's all speculation, but it would be wonderful. I'd I'd love I'd love it if if I'd love it if if, if that were to happen. I'd love Picard. I love uh, I love Sir Patrick. It would be uh, it would be a blast to work with him. I saw him a couple of years ago at a Star Trek convention in Las Vegas, and uh, and it was we had a, it was a, people went ape shit when they saw he was signing, and there was people lining up outside the door waiting to get their pictures signed by him. And I kind of snuck in. I was at my own booth signing pictures, and I heard he was there. And I went in, and I ran up, and I gave him a big hug. And they and the people waiting in line were like, "Oh my God, it's Simon <laughs> Tarsus and you know Jean Luc Picard." So that was fun. So yeah, I'd love to do that again if I can. So with, with the limited power of my podcast, we're gonna make this happen. Make it happen. Make it so. <laughs> make it so. So um, going back a little bit to Jonah Hill. Once again, Jonah Hill obviously is not known as a director. So this yes, has he been, is. He, I mean, he's, he's known as an actor, but he's directed quite a lot. Yeah. Oh, I actually didn't know that. I, thought, um, I, I know mostly as, as as the actor. Yeah, he's directed a couple of features and uh, and a lot of television at this point. Yeah, so he's I mean he's sort of branching out and moving more into that. But yes, obviously he's more of a uh, more known as film actor. I mean he's had a couple of Academy Award nominations as an actor, but he's directed a couple of a uh, couple of independent features and and I think a lot of television at this point. So that was fun to have him on board. So is that something you're considering doing one day in the future, directing? I have. I mean, I've I've directed uh, I've directed some couple of independent films I've uh, I've I've produced a couple of independent films I've directed a lot of theater uh nothing on the scale of uh I don't know that I will ever get to the point of uh you know directing a a, a big budget feature uh but uh I'd love I'd love to stay in the indie world and keep doing that if I can for sure but yeah and I think it's also that uh, winning season uh, winning time season two do we have some ideas where it could come out or when we can expect to see it or i mean if we, if we start filming in the fall as as is uh reported uh then we will probably likely start airing next spring sometime i mean it's about a six month shoot so i would expect to see us on the air sometime next spring 23 early summer something like that so if we start up we starting we're starting in september i think so uh, as far as i know but i, I could be wrong I mean, the show is wildly popular. Were you when you were when you took part in it? Did you know that the show was going to hit big? That it was going to hit that oh, perfect no. niche for fans? Of course not. You never know. You you never know. I mean, you never know what's going to re resonate. I mean, this is something that's a very specific. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a it's a genre piece. It takes place in the 1970s, and a lot of today. I mean, a lot of the the audiences today uh, are younger. You know, skewing younger, and so you know, you, you, you have to, you have to factor in, are they interested in, do they even know who Magic Johnson is? I mean, there's a lot of Magic Johnson and Kareem. I mean, they were obviously icons of their day. Uh, but Adam, Adam McKay has quite a brand, uh, obviously with all of his, with Anchorman and Step Brothers and Don't Look Up and Vice. And so I think Adams, uh, you know, Adams brings a certain amount of cachet and 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 name value to it so people want to watch the show because his name is attached to it and obviously john c Riley and adrian brody and sally field and jason siegel i mean the cast that they put together is beyond so uh i think the the combination of all of those elements uh bodes well for going beyond a season two i would hope well i mean i, I will say from, from my own perspective or at least from my own experience um, I mean, I, I was a fan of basketball for a little while in the 90s. I mean, Michael Jordan, I had to watch Michael Jordan play and a little right. bit with Shaq and Kobe. But for the most part, I have not been, I've not watched basketball, uh, real, you know, live basketball in probably 20 years. But the crossover appeal of winning time and the drama is so good and the acting is so, so good, good that yeah. I think you need to be a basketball fan to really love winning time and how it's presented, um, you know, with the, 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 the combination of the humor and the documentary style, style of it, when, especially when they're – a character they talk directly to the camera things of that nature fourth wall break it's incredibly well done and i think you don't even need to be a basketball fan to enjoy this but show. it's not but you don't have to be a sports it's a it's a great drama right I mean, the show itself it's got it's got obviously great elements of comedy to it um but it's a, it's a great drama if you take away the basketball aspect of it it's about family and it's about relationships you've got the relationship between jerry and Jeannie bus uh, with John C. Riley and Hadley Robinson, who plays his daughter, and the dynamic with Jeannie, the mother, beautifully played by Sally Field, 
And then you've got the Magic Johnson family relationship with his mom and dad mm. and Kareem and his conversion to Muslimism. And there's a lot of different elements. I mean, it's a it's a human drama. If you take away the, the sports aspect of it, you still have got great family stories there. So, so that's what, that's what's so great about it. The writing and the directing. Um, it's not just for sports fans, which I think is that's why it's had a sort of a great crossover appeal. So for season two, once again, I know you can't spoil anything, even though I'm going to ask anyway. Um, I, mean, I, I would tell you, Jeff, but I'd have to kill you. So <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm just going to because I, I would say as a fan, I think it would be great to see Chip Hearn, some more of his backstory. We always see him in the job. We don't see a lot of him off, you know, off the set. I, I agree. I hope, I hope that's the case. I'd like to see more. I'd like to see more Chip Hearn too. So yes, uh, <laughs> I imagine I'd like so. to see more of his backstory as well. So hopefully, hopefully the writers are, are, uh, if they're listening, they're getting work on that right now. Well, I, I'm very excited for uh, Winning Time season two. And I want to thank you so much for the guy for talking with me. You are fantastic. And thank I you, really love uh, Winning Time. And I wish we had time for Supernatural, but unfortunately we, we missed it. But well, I, you asked me about Supernatural. I'm happy to go fire away. All right, perfect. Um, you played um, Edward Kerrigan in um, one of the best episodes, which is Supernatural Christmas. Yes, a very, think, very supernatural, very special Christmas. It was one of my best episodes because I think, and it's really how you played it. Because um, you had this way of being this, kind of an evil monster but with a, like a friendly courteous smile and was that in the directing was that in the script was that you what you brought to it i don't know uh, to be honest with you i auditioned for that part the guy who was the executive producer of the show robert singer um who obviously you know you know uh, uh jim beaver yes uh played a character named bobby singer which is named after robert singer so i worked with bob singer on a show years and years ago one of my very first things called Reasonable Doubts with Marley Matlin and Mark Harmon. So when I went 20 odd years later, I went to audition for Supernatural and Bob was in the room and uh, and he and I got about halfway through the audition. He's like, stop, stop, stop talking. I said, what's wrong? He's like, I don't need to see anymore. I'll see you in Vancouver. Um, I went in and I did basically an impersonation of like Bing Crosby. I came in with a pipe, yes. you know, and I did, I did this whole thing, this kind of like 1950s friendly dad um, and there was something about it that he found was so sinister about my my warm and fuzzy, you know, 1950s conservative dad. Mm. Uh, and that's the, and he and he, he I got to Vancouver and he's like, just do what you did in the audition room. He said, it's chilling. He's like, you're, you're when, when you say, you know, you want some peanut brittle, like the most innocent thing you could possibly offer somebody. He said, but downstairs, you're like, you've got, you know, you've got dead bodies in bags in the basement. Um so I just I just went to town and had fun with it. And that wonderful actress from uh, Vancouver, Marilyn Gann, who played my wife, uh, it was just a great we had a lot of fun. And uh, I remember the, the day that I got impaled with the Christmas tree, um, they made this piece of a Christmas tree that, uh, that I had to walk around with, like strapped to my chest all day long. So I was walking around all day with this, this chunk of, you know, branch of a Christmas tree sticking out of my chest. And out of my back, I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I had to walk, you know, through a door, I had to be careful about walking through a door, so I wouldn't break off the branches on the tree. Uh, one of the strangest jobs that I've ever had, pulling out the fingernails with the, uh, yep. all of that, Flyers, it, was, yep. it was just great, great fun as an actor to, you know, to just, just absolutely have a blast. And I love those two guys, uh, Jensen and Jared were just terrific. I honest, uh, to be honest with you, I was not aware um, I guess is maybe how little I watch television. I when when I did even when I did Star Trek in '92, I had no idea what a big deal Next Generation was at the time. I didn't realize that it was such a monster hit when I was on it, and I also had no idea what a huge hit Supernatural was. You know, and that was that was at season. I don't know. You you know better than I do. Season four, five. Yeah. Um. I, I think it was four, um four. I think it was four. Yeah. So they ended up doing like, what, 14, 15 seasons? Uh, 15, 15, 15 seasons. <laughs> so that was, you know, that was early on, but it was already a huge hit. And so uh, those guys already had such a massive fan base. So uh, I, it was, uh, it's fun to see. I get, I mean, people recognize me from, you know, like, are you, are you uh, the peanut brittle guy? So I love that. <laughs> you know. uh, I, I will say that my first, um, you know, when, when I was checking winning time, I was like, supernatural. That's yeah. <laughs> and it, even even with all the prosthetics yes i mean because yeah the, the voice i knew the voice yeah. okay good uh and and i think it was i think it's kind of cool that this many years later people still recognize you from from this episode i mean what does that kind of tell you about the how 
fervent that fan base is that even when it's like it's, it's like Star Trek, where even if you do one character on one show, yeah. the fans embrace you forever. I mean, I guess it just means I did my job and that makes me happy, makes me proud as an actor. It just means I I, I did what they hired me to do. And I I, I created this character that was uh, that made an impression. Uh, and I, I mean, I still get recognized probably for more than anything else for the Star Trek and for Supernatural all these years later, <laughs> um, which is a testament to uh, the, the, the great writing and, and obviously the directing on Next Generation and on, on Supernatural. Um, but, you know, a, a lot of it is really just the writing. They wrote these great characters and I just, I just showed up and put on the, put on the clothes and did the best job I could. Uh, that, I mean, I worked on that next generation episode five days or something in 1992 and here we are you know 30 something years later talking about it mm -hmm. uh and i'm still getting uh let's see let's see if i have it here somewhere i have a somebody sent me some fan well here somebody somebody sent me a there he is <laughs> i mean i get these i get these probably 25 of these a week in the mail for people to, for me to sign and send back. So it's nice. It's flattering that all these years later, people are still talking about it. Yeah. I think the only thing that bothers a fan was that the character was so good and supernatural, but because he's a monster, they had to kill him off. I was like, it's gotta be a way. He's a, he's, he's a, he's, gotta be, he's, he's a, a pagan. pagan God. There's gotta be a way to come back somehow. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 it was like I said, it was fantastic. I, I really did in, in love it. Um, that was done right. that way. And I'll say the role itself is also very physical. You, I mean, was that you when, when they're actually oh, yeah. fighting with? Um, I believe it was Jensen. You're you're attacking Jensen. Yeah, in the basement. Yeah, he was yeah. big. They're both big guys. Now that is that you or is that a stunt guy doing that? That was me. That was me. <laughs> the, getting thrown up against that wall, and I think I got hung up on the wall, or somebody got hung up on the wall. Yeah, there was a lot of a lot of physicality in that. I remember they put pads on me. They put pads on my back and on my knees because I got thrown up against the wall and then I had to land on the floor. And so they put knees, pads on my knees. I love all that shit. I love it. <laughs> well, a, little I mean, too, a little too old for that stuff now, but it was a lot of fun then. But um, I mean, obviously Supernatural does a lot of, I think they, a couple of times a year they do Supernatural conventions. Yeah. Are you, do you take part in those? I would, I would love to. Nobody's ever invited me, oddly oh, enough. Oh, damn it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's, a, there's a company called Creation Entertainment and they run all that kind of stuff. Uh, I have not been invited to a Supernatural. So if anybody's listening out there, uh, I'd be happy to come. That'd be awesome. And you need to come to uh, one of the local convention on this side, Ruline Comic Con or Terrific Con or one of those two. Yeah, I'd love to. Because you got you to gotta do some autographs back. <laughs> I'd love to. I'd, I'd be, it'd be my pleasure. I'd love to. Thank you. Like I said, it's, it's been fantastic talking with you. And like I said, you've been in some two of my uh, great shows, Winning Time and Supernatural is one of my favorite shows of all time. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad we finally pulled this off, man, after all these months. Yes, it was, it's All worth it. For the emails. I, I canceled on you so many times. I felt so terrible. But I'm glad we got it done. All right, my man. Take care, brother. You well. Thanks, Jeff.